Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Speakeasy Kitchen Edition. I'm your, your sous chef, Jeff Belanger, and I'm glad to be with you guys. I know we're all locked in, like you. Uh, we're under quarantine, and it's tough to get out, but we need to eat. That's one thing that we all have in common, right? We all need to eat. And so uh, given the fact that we need to eat and a lot of us are having to cook those three meals a day, I thought I would reach out to someone I went to high school with. Um, I haven't talked to her literally since I think 1992, but we're going to figure that out in just a second. She's a chef in Austin, Texas. And I was like, would you please make me lunch? And she said yes, which was really far too kind for her. So really, without much further ado, my old high school buddy from Newtown High School, please welcome Rachel Zierzo. Hello, Rachel. Hey, everybody. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. You know, thank you for doing this. Um, Rachel, I, is the last time we talked 1992? Is that possible? I'm guessing so. It's been a while since I've lived in New England, and so I don't think I've run into you on the street. Uh, no, but I have been to Austin, Texas. I've watched the uh, bats fly out from underneath the bridge. Oh, really? And, and I judged a zombie walk there once. Because that's how I roll. So, uh, what have you? Cool. How did you get from Connecticut to Maine, and then down to Texas? What uh, What was your path? Yeah, I. So yeah, I was in college in Maine, and then right after I graduated, I moved down here with. I think I had like two UPS boxes sent, no car, <laughs> and I rented an apartment. And I was um, going to grad school at UT for ecology and evolution. Right. And so that's what brought me to Austin. And I didn't know I was going to stay here for the next uh, 25 years, but I'm still here. It's a great place to live. So it's kind of hard once you get here to, to go anywhere else. No, I get it. It's a beautiful town. Keep Austin weird. I love that. Um, so anyway, I have horrible, horrible news for you, Rachel. Um, I found our yearbook. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I may or may not have your yearbook photo uh, ready for all to see. Uh, <laughs> Look at that. That's pretty Look, funny. Look at Rachel Zierzo back there in uh, Newtown High School class. Well, I won't even say. I won't give away my age, too, but I'm just saying. So there you were. And uh, yeah, that's that's back then. And the flower dress, beautiful, looks wonderful. And and um, I think it's only fair that I should probably have to show mine. I think that's only fair. Only fair. And so uh, here I am. And check out the mullet. I would like you to notice in the back, party, <laughs> party in the back and uh, business in the front. And the irony is that my, my hair is growing so fast that I'm going to be back to that mullet any minute. Like... <laughs> any minute so um so yeah so okay i'm very excited for this because i always i enjoy cooking my whole family we we all there's cook right now for the next hour. oh sorry there's that she is live for the next hour <laughs> so um so we all cook in my family my daughter has food allergies she's allergic to eggs nuts and dairy and my wife's got gluten issues. And so feeding us is totally a challenge. And when my daughter was one, I weighed 60 pounds more than I do now. That was that was my record. I had topped out. And I remember she's one years old. And that was back, you're, I know you're a mom, when you've got young kids and they're running around and dinner is sometimes like literally like four Twinkies, you know? Well, maybe not for you, but they were for me. And, and I was like, I got to do something. And so I started running and exercising. And then we all started looking at our diets about like, well, what, what makes us feel good, right? What makes us feel healthy, sleep well, get good exercise and good workouts. And I started making changes 60 pounds ago and 11 wow. years ago, you know? And, um, and I, I just noticed like, I, I just tried to listen to my body. And I love your website because it's not just about cooking you're all about like this whole lifestyle thing. And so how did you go from, you know, ecology and evolution to, to becoming a full-time chef? Yeah. Well, before I say that, before I talk about that, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you're trying to lose weight or improve your health, you have to listen to your body. And whenever you're eating something or you're doing an activity, really pay attention to how you feel and that will inform you 
Um, you know, should I keep doing it this way or should I try something else? And so many people will either not be listening to that feedback or they maybe go on a prescriptive diet that is made for one person, but it's not one size fits all. And so it can be easy to kind of be robotic about your diet and the things that you do in your lifestyle, but not really be paying attention to how it's affecting you. So I think that you really hit the nail on the head with that. And that's why you've had so much success. And another thing I wanted to say is um, the dish that we're making today, minestrone milanese, it's a version of minestrone soup from the north of Italy. Okay. Um, it's gluten-free, dairy-free, unless you want to garnish it with cheese and um, egg-free and nut-free. So your family should be able to make this. And Excellent. Everyone can eat it. <laughs> hey, look who's saying hi. There's Emily Timmel. She went to high school with us too. Oh, Yay. Yay, Emily. Hello, Emily. Thanks so much for tuning in. Are you able to uh, cook for all these people? Because there's a bunch of people that just keep kind of floating. I'm making around. extra. So okay, good. whoever's hungry when lunch comes around, um, they can they can have a bowl. Right. All but right. I think you might have to bring your own bowl. That's the only thing. That's fair. That's totally fair. So cook, love, heal. Um, I love it. I, I, I read Eat, Pray, Love. I did. I read it. And and I love how it's it's about a lifestyle. And I know for me, that's what I had to do, right? I I, I had to, it's not a diet. Like you can't say like, well, I can't have this. I, I can have that. Or, or I, for me, it was just yeah. about like, how do I just live every day knowing that I'm human? And sometimes like I'm going to be around friends who are eating pizza and drinking beer and I'm going to go for it. Mm -hmm. But I also love that analogy, right? Like if you get a flat tire on the car, you don't go slash the other three. Right. So, so like, you know, if you have that, if you have that pizza wings and beer night, it's okay, but tomorrow get back on track, you know? And, and so I've, I've tried to live that way. And, and I love following you on Instagram too, because not only is it like half food porn, which is great. I love that and appreciate it. But um, you're also very much into nature. You're out there taking pictures, you're doing hikes and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's been fun to follow you there. Um, and I imagine too, that's got to be a big part of your lifestyle, right? It's, it's not just the fuel that goes in, but you know, how you, how you live your life. And I had read on your website how um, you were a runner as well, right? You were, you were running and then. I was, um, yeah, I did that for a long, long time mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed it. Um, I think it was like a little bit before my daughter was born that I stopped running and I got more into yoga and that ended up supporting my health a lot better than running during like pregnancy and after you know that period um sometimes intense exercise can be counterproductive if you have a lot going on in your life and it can actually add to stress right um so it kind of just depends on the person and what stage they're in in life um you know what's going to be best for them yeah no exercise wise but yeah I, I i ran cross country in high school and college and then took a little break when I came down here because it was so hot. I didn't really know how to deal with it. Right. And then uh, after some years, I started running again. And then um, I've been on like a 13, 14 year hiatus from running now. But well, you can always go back, right? That's but you're right. But you're hiking and it's been fun to, to kind of like catch up with you through social media and, and see what everyone's up to and see what you're doing. And uh, your kid looks awesome. I mean, it looks like you're, you're having fun, not just with your life, but, yeah. but being a mom. And you teach cooking classes. This is what you've mm -hmm. been doing. So not just, um, you know, not just a chef for yourself, but like you've been teaching classes, which of course we can't do right now, son of a gun. There's you with uh, some of your students. And um, and I didn't know you actually look at this in costume and everything. Um, are, are you making sushi in this picture? Is that what right. I'm? Right. Yeah. So I've got this uh, sushi outfit that I wear. Uh, my husband got when he lived in Japan many many years ago. Nice. And I just find that um, people think it's really really fun when they enter the class and I'm all dressed up like a sushi chef. Yeah. No, I, I get kind it. Of, I kind of wish I have an outfit for every theme, but so far I've started with the sushi class. To totally fair. My da my daughter is like a sushi monster and it's going to literally break my bank. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've tried to make it. We've tried to make it at home 
and uh, I've it looks horrible. It tastes okay. The taste is good, but it looks it's a mess. Um, I obviously don't have what it takes. The other one of the other things I've learned is that um, everyone can cook, right? You can combine foods and stuff like that, but there really is such an art to this. And I took a cooking class not that long ago, and I didn't I didn't even know that I didn't know how to use a knife. I didn't know the, the bear claw thing. I didn't even know that. I just put my fingers out on the onion and chopped. And they're like, oh my God, your, your fingertips are going to be in the sauce here. And so I was like, oh, the bear claw. I had to learn all this stuff. And it's kind of cool to be at our age. I won't say what that is, but we're roughly the same age and to still be learning new things. And so um, anyway, maybe we should I, start I against... Really I really learn something new every single day sure. through cooking, which is really cool. And I'm actually just going to get this started since everybody's hungry. Yeah. And, All right. Um, what are you putting in? Hopefully this will quiet down in a second. I might need the lid for this. Oh, yeah. So, so quiet down in a second. No worries. Pan is pretty hot. So... I, I heated up the, the pot and then put the olive oil in, followed by the onions. Yep. And I like to do it like that so that if you put the oil in a cold pan and wait for it to heat up, usually I forget about what's happening. I start multitasking, doing something else. And then before I know it, the oil is burning. And you have to throw it out, start over. Totally. The lid. And you're lucky to have help. Hey, <laughs> Nelson, camera. Hello, Nelson. Amazing uh, tech. Does all the tech for my business. Um, well, it's good to have that. And helps me cook. We do a lot of cooking together. Mm -hmm. And um, I recommend teach your children how to cook, or maybe they can teach you how to cook something they learn from YouTube. It's so much more fun to cook together or at least kind of delegate different tasks. But so one thing that I didn't know besides a lot of cutting techniques, when I went to culinary school, I went to a natural food school back in 2004 to 2006, so a while ago. And I got into it through... Um, because I was trying to improve my health. My health was really down the tubes when I was in my 20s. If anybody knew me then, I was about maybe uh, 30 to 40 pounds less than I am now, which is super scary because um, that is scary. I had a lot of health issues and I was just... Um, We're going to cook the cat. How did Ginger scrub? He was locked in the garage, I think. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> By accident. And so anyway, I, I was suffering from a lot of health issues and it really felt like I was just in a downward spiral. And I found this uh, natural foods macrobiotic cooking school that unfortunately has since closed, but I, I was there for two and a half years. And as I was going through the program, you would have classes two or three times a week and then you would go home and you would practice the cooking skills and you would um, learn about healing techniques, and then just gradually heal yourself kind of from the inside out. And it was, it was a really amazing program. My original teacher there now lives um, up in your neck of the woods in Boston. Okay. Um, but anyway, it was very trans transformative, and I think it really saved my life. And so... One of the things I learned, one of the many, many things I learned by going to culinary school was how to layer the flavors in the pot when you're making a soup. And so I think I probably used to make a soup by just heating up some water or broth and then putting all the ingredients in, bringing it to a boil, salting it, and that's, that's it. Did you steal that from my recipe book? Because that's how I roll. That's... <laughs> So then I learned that you can really um, make the dish a lot more flavorful by layering the ingredients. So what I'm doing now is I'm cooking 
cooking the onions and the celery, and I meant to cut the carrot next. Because the onions, carrots, and celery I typically put in first. They're the harder vegetables. Sometimes I'll actually cook them until they're caramelized if I'm making um, the blended soup, like a squash soup. But I want them to actually be more intact for this minestrone soup. So I'm now not going to but this way you're going to kind of have the flavor of each vegetable come out in the final product. And you're gonna take advantage of a longer cooking time for things like onion, which can be really pungent and it brings out the sweetness to saute it in some oil first. So now I've got carrot, celery, and onion in here. Gonna let that saute for a little while. And I'll add my garlic. I have a recipe for this right on cookbookleftfield.com. It's really easy to find. I think it's right there on my front page, or you can go to the recipes tab and it's on the first page because I recently put this one up. I love this soup because you can use little bits of vegetables that you have in your refrigerator. You don't need a whole lot of any one vegetable. So like I used maybe an eighth of a cabbage. Cabbage is like my favorite, new, new favorite vegetable during this stay at home period because I've been using the same cabbage for like two weeks and it, I still have some left. I don't even know how that's possible. Right. But I've been using it in a lot of different dishes and it's so versatile. You know, from like salads to soups to stir fries, using right. a lot of things. So, uh, uh, Rachel, um, Connie here has a comment. She says it. You make it look so easy. She would find some way to ruin it. <laughs> so, so okay. how do you make this? Like, how do you make? How do you approach someone who says, "I'm a terrible cook. I could ruin boiled water." Um, how do, How do you help people find the joy in this? So. What I've discovered, trying to turn this down so it won't be so noisy. I can't find my list of this, huh? Um, so Connie, that's a really great comment and question. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because every day I learn a new cooking skill. Even though I've been doing this for my career for a long time, I'm still learning. And I feel like Cooking is kind of like learning a foreign language or learning how to play an instrument where you're never done learning it and you can always improve. And like with each new song you learn or each new um, phrase you learn, if it's a foreign language, it enriches your life. So like every new recipe or every new technique I learn or like a little tip or a little trick that I learned with cooking it becomes part of what I do and part of who I am and makes, makes it easier, makes it more efficient, makes it more fun. So like, I'll give you one example. I used to cook all the time before I went to culinary school. And then when I was there, I noticed everybody was using this knife and it's a Japanese vegetable knife. Um, unfortunately, this brand, this maker stopped making them a few years ago in Japan, but you can get other brands. It's a um, Nakiri knife. And I have one that's made with a carbon steel blade and a stainless steel sheath. So the carbon steel blade is like razor sharp. So that's why when I cut through something, it's like butter. I mean, it literally feels like butter that I'm cutting through, even though it's a vegetable. Um, and so getting like proper tools, little by little, will make it much easier and then just little um you know tips like what i was saying about how when i make a soup i like to saute the ingredients one by one to layer the flavors all these things will just kind of add up over time 
Uh, and I've definitely made use over time of um, not only cookbooks to learn, but YouTube videos, uh, things like um, PBS cooking shows. I say the Food Network is more trendy and a lot of times I'll see what they're doing and kind of cringe because they might be mistreating their knife where it's going to dull your knife right away or they might be, um, you know, some of the things on the Food Network are more trendy, whereas the PBS shows are like real home cooking and practical skills that you can use um, every day and they don't use such exotic ingredients. So, hey, Rachel, ex uh, speaking of exotic ingredients, Andrew wants to know, are you using a regular green cabbage like you just grab at the store or is this something special? Yeah, this is just green cabbage. Okay. Um, so what I'm putting in this soup is um, onion, carrot, celery, butternut squash instead of potato that's in the recipe because I don't have any potatoes. So I okay. substituted squash. And then I'm using green cabbage zucchini, and then later on I'll put in some peas, rice, um, beans, and turkey. And you can either make it vegetarian or add some kind of protein if you want. Like also, for every, everyone who's watching, listening, whether you're watching this on the playback, the very first uh, comment in this thread under the video is a link to the recipe on Rachel's website. So you guys can click on that. And... Uh, We've been putting up Rachel's website throughout this. So, of course, it's cookloveheal.com. And you should also follow Rachel on Instagram and Facebook. So every Wednesday at noon central time, that's 1 p.m. Eastern, um, Rachel's been doing Isolation Kitchen, where she's doing stuff exactly like this right now. And you can follow her on her Facebook page. And you can see that every Wednesday at noon. You can see the videos she's been making. So that's really cool that you're doing this. I mean, you, you can't teach in person but you can absolutely do this virtually oh wait want to see the steam look at that <laughs> yeah thank you so much um kind of the first week that we were full-time at home and my daughter was on spring break uh, uh we did a uh, facebook live every day at lunchtime and we were kind of working out the kinks with the technology we're and now we decide to do it once a week on Wednesdays and kind of gear up for it every week. And we'll definitely be taking requests if there's anything that people want to learn. Um, that will be really fun. I just put in some chicken stock. You can also use water or vegetable stock. Um, but since we're home a lot right now, we've been roasting a chicken once a week and then making a broth out of the bones right and yeah we roast the chicken on the grill that's my husband's specialty is making mm. chicken on the grill right um so he'll, he'll show you how to do that another time um andrew also wants to know uh what kind for uh vegetarians what kind of uh protein would you use to substitute for the meat lentils beans like what do you think would be good in this recipe oh yeah uh so I have some barlotti beans, which are also called cranberry beans that I made a while back and I had some in the freezer. Those are really delicious. I also like any kind of white bean, like a cannellini or navy bean or white lima bean. Those will work really well. Um, I haven't used lentils in this recipe. It might work like a, one of the brown or green lentils. You can try that. Right on. I've also, I've also made it without any beans in it at all. And I put um, fresh green beans uh, maybe in the last five to 10 minutes of cooking. Okay. And that's really summery and delicious. How have your grocery stores been, Rachel? Are they uh, pretty stocked up? Can you get the ingredients you would usually buy? So it's been, it's been variable, but uh, yesterday Nelson went, he's, we kind of are trying to shop every two weeks now just to see if we can do it. Yeah. We're getting some fresh stuff from uh, like our garden and a CSA. So we think we can probably stock up on staples every two weeks and not have to go out as much. And he said he could find just about everything except for um, they didn't have 
a lot of rice or beans or um, toilet paper. Yeah. How is your toilet <laughs> paper supply? Else, like produce was stocked up and yeah. uh, dairy products were stocked up. and. So you're doing okay. How is your toilet paper supply? But what they're doing at the grocery stores here, I don't know how it is there. Um, when you get there, there's a line out the door and they'll let a couple people in when yep. a couple people exit. And so they're limiting the number of people that can come into the store at the same time. And they're also controlling the flow of the grocery cart. So as soon as someone's done with the grocery cart, they sanitize it and put it back in the queue and only let people use the carts that have come from that pile when they go right. to the store. And then this is one particular store that we really like to go to called Central Market in South Austin. And then um, they also have tape at the grocery stores in the line so that you can only stand six feet apart. Like yeah. Minimum six feet apart. Yeah, it's the same thing here. Um, they're doing all the pretty much all those same measures. Um, so your your in person cooking classes are obviously on hold right now, but now you're also doing some uh, special virtual ones. I've noticed on your website, so people from anywhere, right? They can come take your classes. Doesn't matter where they are, and uh, they can learn from you right. directly, which is pretty awesome. I mean that that opens you up from just like an Austin chef to a global one, right? I mean we got people in the chat room right now from uh, the UK people all oh, over the cool. US. So, um, and they're all hungry. I hope the soup's yeah, coming yeah. along. So the online course that I'm offering right now is called uh, Cook Naturally Without a Recipe. And one thing that I really love about it is you learn all the basic knife skills. Um, we've got the camera work going so that you can see different angles on the cutting board and you'll learn how to cut things like Carrot, celery, kale, uh, garlic, parsley, um, sweet potatoes, butternut squash, avocado, like a lot of basic things that you gonna might be using every day. Um, and then it goes into making different dishes um, where you'll learn basic cooking techniques. Right. And then the last module you put all your skills together the nice skills the cooking techniques and you make a complete meal and then i ask everybody to post pictures of their um of their process or their complete dish at the end um, on a facebook group i have just for that class and it kind of cheers people on and um gets people excited about um cooking at home and and Let's talk about the subscription. yeah and then the other thing that's... <laughs> yeah, plug the subscriptions. <laughs> yeah, the, the other thing that's kind of um, in the works but we'll have ready in a week or two is a subscription. And so basically you'll get an email a couple times a week and one of the emails will have um, a video and a recipe to inspire you that week to maybe try something new, stay healthy, keep your immune system strong, and I'm really trying to make these recipes accessible. They're not going to be require a lot of um, fancy equipment or obscure ingredients that are tough to find, especially in these times. But yes, yeah. um, basic ingredients and all all the recipes are gluten free and dairy free, and a lot of vegan options. So, you know, if I'm doing a, a chickpea curry, I'll also show. Um, how to make it with chicken it, or vice versa. Um, and so there'll be kind of options for many different um, dietary preferences. Sure. And then I'm also going to have um, like all those recipes and videos will be archived. And it's really designed for people that are either stuck at home right now or they've just kind of made that commitment that they want to cook more at home for whatever reason. Well, I think um, now's, now's a great time for people to sort of rediscover cooking because we're stuck, mm -hmm. right? And so, and this is something I've noticed just on Facebook, like my own friends, 
people are posting pictures of their food porn, right? The, the dishes they're making, yeah. the, the homemade breads, cool. the, the homemade pies. So people are like, they're proud of it. They're like, oh, wow, I've always complained. I have like 10 minutes to feed myself at night. I actually have time to prepare a real meal now. So I do feel like we have an opportunity to rediscover it. But I want to address something that I know a lot of people are feeling. Um, when, when this first went down and they said, okay, everybody, we're locking in, the kids can't go to school. Um, some people were like, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna work out every day and I'm going to eat really well and I'm going to get in the best shape of my life. And then all of a sudden, anxiety hits, right? And people start looking for comfort food or I know for me, like snack food. Sometimes I'll find myself just eating, not because I'm hungry, but because like it's just perpetual. Give, give me like something to just chew on. And um, I don't know if you've seen some of the memes that have been going around, but um, but they are just on point. So we all had these these great intentions of uh, of of you know eating well. Oh no, we just lost the camera. Hey, hey. look! Oh, at Nelson, we, we lost the camera. Nelson, we need help. <laughs> we'll go overhead while Nelson fixes that. So uh, Rachel, I'm gonna show some of the memes they've been amazing um this one's uh this one's one of my favorites um so after this quarantine will the producers of my 600 pound life just find me or do i call them or how does this work uh i totally get it because there's people out there that are just like eating obsessively uh you know they're, we're packing on the pounds i know from from my perspective um for me it's there we go uh for me if it's not in the house, I won't eat it, right? So if it's not right there, I don't tend to grab it. There you go. Oh, you're back. Okay. <laughs> Still there? Yeah. <laughs> so so anyway, we're okay. back. That there little little camera mishap. That's how we know it's real. <laughs> so um so yeah, so some of these memes are just about like everybody packing on the pounds, eating so much food. Um but if it's not in the house, then, you know, you won't eat it. Um, and then, of course, going out is like this one says, why does leaving the house feel like I'm making a supply run on an episode of The Walking Dead? Uh, it does feel like that, right? You're, get, you're getting out there and you're just like, oh, man, it's kind of real, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So that's really so many, so many issues are coming up right now where, um, we kind of don't have anywhere to escape or hide. It's like all of our issues are just kind of, people think that they've got all their shit together and then they're, they go home for a um, Thanksgiving dinner or something and they're like, oh man, that was really hard. Or, you know, yeah. all these issues that we were kind of able to keep at bay because um, we could go out and do other stuff and keep super busy. Now they're resurfacing and um, bubbling up and wreaking havoc. And <laughs> yeah, no, I get um, it. Do you have any weaknesses? So, I mean, one one way we've been able to cope with, I can kind of speak to my own experience. Um, it is really hard to keep your spirits up sometimes. Um, and so just having gratitude every day for what we do have, we realize how fortunate we are. And we're always kind of giving thanks, thinking of all the things that, that we are appreciative of and that um, you know, we, we have to be thankful for. It's been really helpful, but then also just in practical terms, having, um, like setting up something where you're maybe accountable for making a big pot of soup. Maybe you call a friend or text a friend and say, Hey, I need, I need to keep on track with my um, making healthy meals. Let's all make soup on Mondays and share pictures. Or um, maybe you want to join one of the Facebook groups. That's like, uh, there's one called corn uh, cooking during quarantine or something. Okay. Uh, where everyone's like sharing ideas, but then also when you do cook a meal, make a lot of it. And we've been doing that where we make two or three times the amount we usually do. And then when it's time for lunch, instead of grabbing like chips and salsa or something like that, because you're in a hurry or you just don't, it's not because you're in a hurry maybe, but it's because you don't feel motivated to cook because it takes some kind of, creative energy 
then you've already got something really healthy in the fridge to have as leftovers. And um, I'm not really much of a leftover person in general because I like to have really fresh stuff all the time and I get spoiled because we both cook and like yeah. can make meals really quickly. But I have to tell you, I've been totally loving leftovers right now because I don't think I have that same kind of energy to put into cooking every single day. And what I do with my leftovers is I always add a little something fresh. So like with this minestrone soup, if I were to reheat just enough for another meal, say tomorrow, I would probably chop up some spinach or chop up some fresh kale or chop up some parsley and put it in right at the end of reheating. And okay. it just livens it up and makes it taste so much better and it looks better. And you don't feel like you're kind of um, having the same thing over and over. Uh, Andrew wants to know if uh, the soup freezes well, if you're t especially if you're making it in bulk. Can you uh, freeze this stuff and for that a week is later? A good question. I think I think I'm going to put in um, some beans. These almost look like refried beans the way I cooked them. So you know, I don't know that this particular soup would freeze that well because it has so many whole vegetables in it. They might kind of lose their texture. You could always try it with a small portion before you freeze the whole thing. Um, so maybe just make enough for like three to four days and store it in a glass container. Um, so I put in some and some cooked beans. Usually I put in raw rice or raw pasta and just let it cook in the broth but I already had some rice cooked, so it made more sense to just put in the cooked rice. And sometimes I make this soup vegetarian, and then if later on in the week I have some cooked chicken or turkey, then I add it into my soup later on in the week. It looks so amazing. I don't know if that was a good do freeze. <laughs> I freeze yeah. beans if I make a big pot of beans. I definitely freeze those and they freeze really well. I also freeze uh, chicken stock or vegetable stock, anything that's like um, doesn't have the chunks of vegetables in it, I think freezes really well. And then another thing I started freezing a lot is bananas because you can freeze them whole and then slice them up and put them in a smoothie. Um, so those are things I know freeze really well. Um, if it's a pureed soup, like a butternut squash soup that's blended up, that should freeze really well too. Yeah, no, I get it. I know for us, uh, some of the things we freeze, I, I feel like sometimes we can freeze them once, right? Like uh, spaghetti sauce, we can freeze a couple times, but like if we make a stew, it, if you freeze it one time and cook it again, it's it's mushy, but it's edible, but you can't you can't go two rounds, you know. So exactly. I'm trying to make a stretch. Uh, you you definitely only want to reheat the portion that you're going to um, eat that day. So like this pot of soup is really big, and so um, I would only take out like whatever I need the next day and keep the rest refrigerated. That way it won't get reheated too many times. So when you were a kid, Rachel, was there someone in your life that taught you a, a love of cooking? Uh, someone close to you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if my mom's watching, but she'll probably watch this later. My <laughs> mom was definitely the, um, she made dinner every single night at our house. I mean, we, we never ate out and that was like a huge thing with her working full time and going to school a lot of the time and um, making dinner and I really learned a lot of stuff by um, watching. Right. And um, when she wasn't home, we would make uh, easy stuff. Uh, so I was always kind of experimenting in the kitchen. And uh, so I definitely, when I went to culinary school, I just build, built on what I already knew um, from, from learning from my mom. 
What about and you? She, she Sorry, had a garden a lot of times and um, cooked with a lot of herbs. And that's something that I've, I've always loved to do too because of her. Yeah, look at you. Here you are with, uh, looks like you're uh, digging on some herbs here with one of your students, a, a kid. Yeah, so this is uh, some parsley. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was on my porch. Um, we're cutting some basil and mint to go in our sushi rolls. Oh, nice. And what are you cutting up now? This is parsley as a stage over here. So there is a little trick with uh, mincing fresh herbs, which is make sure the leaves are dry. So I usually will wash the herbs earlier in the day so that they can just air dry. Or like the first thing that I'll wash will be the herbs. I might put them in a glass of water, the stems in a glass of water, and then they'll just air dry. And then they'll be really easy to chop. If you leaves are wet, uh, they'll kind of just stick to the stick to the knife. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I feel like I'm learning something because, uh, you know, I, I, I do enjoy the process. Um, I'm curious, though. I know some days when it feels like a chore, yeah. like when, when you just have to cook, uh, it can be not fun and it, it actually affects the taste. If that's, I know that sounds crazy, but I swear it does. Um, how oh, do you get so yourself, true. yeah, but how do you get yourself in like a mental state where you're, you're like, no, I want this to be something special. This isn't just sustenance. It's not just whatever, but like, something that, that really, you know, is meaningful to my family or friends or whoever you're serving it to. So I just put some tomato sauce in there. Or sometimes I put, um, I put some tomato puree in there. Put more or less of that depending on how you like it. Um, that is totally true. That kind of um, goes to the heart of the energetics of cooking. So whatever energy you put into your food will translate to the person that's eating it, whether it's yourself or somebody else. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you do a lot of cooking, this is something that chefs uh, struggle with a lot. When you cook for other people all the time and then you try to cook for yourself also, if, if you're depleted from doing so much cooking for other people, the food just doesn't taste very good at home, right. even though because you kind of left all your good energy outside the house. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, so one thing you can do if you feel like um, you personally need more nourishment um, go out to eat or get some takeout to take a break. Yeah, we haven't done since all this started, but there's three of us at home that can help cook, so it's easier. Um, but then also, um, kind of besides that, you can turn on some music. We love to listen to music when we're cooking, sing along. Um, you could have a glass of wine or a glass of iced tea, something that you really enjoy when you're cooking, so that you're not it's not feeling like it's this really serious thing. It's more like a creative endeavor and something that you're creating as you go. Right. Um, so do you have any suggestions for that? Anything that you've tried that makes it more fun? <laughs> I think for me, sometimes I know what, when I'm, if it's my night to cook and I'm not feeling it, sometimes I do just have to simply forgive myself and say, um, you know, when we put it on the table, we, the in our in our house we have a saying: "This is food, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> this this will make you feel full and uh, get you through to tomorrow. We'll we'll just try again tomorrow night. You know, we'll we'll hope for the best. Um, yeah, so so some, sometimes you know, forgiving yourself, but sometimes um, you know, you you get into it. You get excited about the the recipe, or you get excited about what you're going to cook. Um, we try to get our daughter involved last night. She cooked. I was the assistant, which was awesome. Oh, cool. She made ramen, uh, ramen with like veggies. And we had, uh, we actually had steak with it, which was really good. Okay. And, um, and so we want to teach her, you know, it, it is something to celebrate, but I also think about this too, because I've, I've had people in my life that have had food issues and I don't just mean allergies. I mean like disorders. And so, uh, how do you, 
deal with someone who's had a, an eating disorder where food is something they absolutely have to have, but it can trigger really bad behavior, whether that's overeating or undereating or whatever. There's all kinds of people out there where food is a real issue uh, beyond yeah. just allergies. And so how do you kind of approach someone and say, you know, have a good relationship with food? That is really tough one, but so important. Um, let me, let me think. I mean, it, it really is more of a mental health issue. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I think of mental health as part of our physical health. I don't really see it as separate. Of course. It's all intertwined, but, um, I think that it can require, um, some intervention, whether it's a spiritual intervention or a um, psychological, you know, therapy intervention to really help people um, get back to their um, wanting to really care for themselves and nourish their bodies. Yeah. Um, like when food becomes kind of the enemy it becomes a downward spiral. It's, it's very hard for people to um, have enjoyment with food. And it's, it's like the way you look at food is um, kind of the opposite of how you want to look at food. If you want to heal yourself and be nourished. So I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, except that there are certain foods that will help heal the part of your body that, which is like the center core of your body that can um, reduce anxiety and reduce some of those feelings of, um, you know, like, uh, like you're completely um, adverse to eating or you might be losing your appetite. Sure. So soup is one of those things, especially, um, I have a recipe on my blog for creamy butternut squash soup. That's a non-dairy soup, but it's blended up. So it's, it has a creamy texture and it has a sweet flavor. There's no sugar in it, but it's very sweet from sauteing the onions and adding the squash. And then you blend it all up and it literally starts to heal the core of your body, like your spleen and your pancreas and your stomach. And some of those, areas of the body are directly linked to um, our mental health. Yeah, you know, we are feeling anxiety, we're feeling um, uh, nervous or anxious, or um, it can help calm the nervous system as well. Yeah, any kind of soup is is really deeply nourishing compared to dry snack foods, say you can see the difference in the and the quality of it. You've got like a lot of dissolved minerals. It's very easy to digest. You're not putting like over taxing your body to try to digest it. Yeah, no, and, and so, it's comforting, right? Like, like, What's like that? it's comforting, warm soup is like, when we're sick, we want warm soup. When it's cold and rainy outside, we want warm soup. It's, um, it, it puts us into like a happy place. And actually we have a question here from uh, Candice. Do you find colorful food actually lifts people's moods? So I'm guessing like green peppers and red peppers and tomatoes and uh, the, the actual color of the food. Does that, do you think that's true? You know, I, I would agree with that. Um, I don't know if I've, I've thought about it in those terms, but I think it's really true. Um, I think I feel happier when I sit down and see the colors on my plate. Yeah. And in fact, if I'm sitting down to eat and it's just kind of monochromatic, I'll get some herbs and maybe get some pickles out of the fridge or something to garnish the plate because it just looks better and then it ends up tasting better. There's, there's an expression that says, um, we eat first with our eyes. Yeah, of and course. And you know, you know who else would agree with that is, of course, the M&M company. There's there's a reason M and M's come in a variety of colors. They they discovered that if they just had a bowl of green M and M's, people will not eat as many as they would as if there's a whole rainbow of colors in there. And so wow. we're sort of drawn to that, uh, and it makes total sense. Oh wow, are we are we is it ready to eat? Come on. 
Oh God, it looks good. Let's. I have the difficult task of being a taste tester and a cook today. I think Does it need salt? Tell me. Right. So, um, you need to have the right amount of salt. So that's just something that comes with experience and testing out different recipes and your particular taste. But in general, if the soup tastes very blah and maybe like um, dirty dishwater, hopefully it won't taste that like that. But if it just doesn't yeah. have a lot of flavor, you probably don't have enough salt because with all of these vegetables and broth and beans and turkey, if this doesn't taste good, then it must right. just not have enough salt in it. So I would say for a big pot of soup like this, I'm going to need at least a teaspoon and a half to two teaspoons of salt. And I use like a quart or a um, salt that has also a lot of trace minerals. And um, so you can add it little by little and kind of try it and then get to where you have just the right amount of salt. I was kind of adding it as I went and I'm um, adding a, a couple pinches every time I added some vegetables. And that also helps to flavor the vegetables, not just the broth. Sure. Um, so how does it taste? Mind, if you think, oh, I, I messed up the soup. It doesn't taste good. Well, maybe you just need a little bit more salt. And all those fresh um, ingredients, it looks amazing. So tell us, talk, talk us through the flavor. Go slowly, because because yeah. we can't <laughs> we can't get there to Austin to get a bowl. So we're gonna have to live vicariously through you, Rachel. So hopefully you guys can make this at home sometime this week. Yeah. Um, feel free to substitute anything in the recipe that if you don't have it, either leave it out or substitute something else. Um. Okay, I'll try to describe the flavor. It's a little tangy from the tomato sauce. It's yep. um, very hot, it's warm. Um, I can taste the sweetness from the carrots and the squash. And I can, there's like a very fresh green taste from the parsley and the sage. So I think the soup, I, it's amazing. I, I make the soup every now and then at home. I've been making it more now that I'm home all day long, <laughs> right? Um, because I just, you know, it's just easier to put the pot on and, and be doing this during the day. Um, but when I start thinking about minestrone soup, it's like my mouth starts watering because I remember how delicious it was the last time I made it. Um, yeah, I get it. No, I, there's nothing like soup. I, for me, it, it's often a weekend thing when we're around yeah. all day Sunday or something. Although now every day is a Sunday. <laughs> so uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to kind of like rediscover cooking and rediscover our joy of it. We all eat, every one of us. And I mean, who better to, to feed you than you, right? I mean, to, to learn what you like and, and what you don't like and things like that. So I think it's awesome what you're doing. People should definitely tune into your, your live Facebooks every Wednesday at noon central time. Um, and also uh, your classes, your online classes, which is great because right now it's an opportunity. You can't meet in person, but maybe you can have uh, students from all over the world now that are that are learning to rediscover the joy of cooking, but also like how it relates to their wellness. And I can't recommend enough. Spend some time on Rachel's website. There it is. Cook, love, heal. And you've got a lot of great stuff on there about your your approach, not just to cooking, but to like wellness in general. Uh, your your whole body, right? How it's a it's a whole thing there. So um, you know, really cool what you're doing, and not bad for two kids from Newtown, huh? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that. Did you grow up in Newtown, or did you move there at some point during school? Yeah, I was ten when I moved to Newtown, and okay, that's where that my is, yeah. So where did did you ever go to Sandy Hook School, or I did. I went to Sandy Hook in fifth grade. Yep. That was a strange. I'm so confused about that. I must. What? Whose classroom were you in? Miss. Oh, we just lost the camera again. Uh, we, Mrs. Page. Mrs. Page was my. Uh, that, was my, that was the classroom I was in. Isn't that yeah. hilarious? 
Yeah, I, I came in uh, like halfway through the year. I moved there from Pennsylvania. Okay, and so, so Lynn Latanzio was in our class. Was she? Remember that? I yeah, thought I didn't. Was, okay. She she moved to Newtown that year also at the beginning of the year. And um, I thought she was the coolest kid I ever met in my whole life. Remember, she used <laughs> to bring the boom. She used to bring the boom box to school. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Michael Jackson and Madonna out on the playground. Yeah. And well, nobody had ever done that in the history of But Right, yeah. Was, we well the, was, the the boys used to listen to Dr. Demento. Oh. <laughs> so we and, we had, we had a, tape a tape recorder with Jim Heatman and uh and we would listen to Dr. Demento. That was our thing. So <laughs> <laughs> And then we had typewriters in the back of the classroom. Do you remember that? The manual typewriters? Oh, you're really making us look pretty old, Rachel. I'm just saying. If, like if you if you finished your work it was like a treat. You could go to the back of the room and practice typing right. with the um, flip pages. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then um, do you remember dinosaurs? No. Oh, no. I remember the green footprints going to Sandy Hook School, but I don't remember well, dinosaurs. I'm pretty sure that half the year in science class, we learned about dinosaurs. And the other half, we learned about rocks. <laughs> that sounds like any fifth grade ever, though. I mean, to be fair. <laughs> no it was it was a it was a crazy experience and of course um uh, through my adult life when people i i consider like sandy hook my hometown because i was there from 10 my parents lived there right up until a year ago so that was where we went oh, for yeah. all the holidays and everything else and for the longest time you would go somewhere and you'd say like where, where'd you grow up and i'd say ah this small town in connecticut you know sort of near the new york line you know you've never heard of it and now I don't say it because it's like farting in a car, you know, yeah. they just go, Oh, and then they don't know what to say. And, um, yeah. and it's, it's a shame to have had childhood memories overwritten by such a horrible event. Um, right. but that's, that's our hometown, man. That's, that's where we were. Is your family still there? My family's still there. And, um, my daughter actually went to the day camp there for two weeks. Um, two summers ago at the new school that they built on the property there. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that I mean, was a, that was a really healing thing to go back and, um, you know, tour the new school and just kind of have new memories. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely have those nightmares of like remembering being in all the different classrooms of different years and like, just, you know, imagining, yeah. A terrible thing happening. And now I can think back on like what the new school is like. It's very beautiful. It's yeah. two stories. Um, so someday it'd be nice if you can stop by there. Um, I've, I've seen it from the outside and yeah, oh, you're right. Okay. It's uh, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's, it's a, it's on a different footprint than the original building, of course. And uh, I think those are all good things, but yeah, it was, um, it was a tough thing to go through for, for someone from that area where my parents live, they live sort of near Treadwell park, which I know most people won't get, but so Tr Treadwell park, like they had to go anywhere in town. They'd have to go by the school, like to get anywhere, whether you're going on 84 or going to the grocery store or whatever, like you go by the school and, uh, it was hard. It was hard on us all, uh, mentally, emotionally. Of course, my, my parents had neighbors who, of course, you know, had kids in the school and everyone knows someone. And that was a really, really tough thing to go through. Um, and, uh, but, but something that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a tragedy. I think all we can do is just try to work to make the world a little bit better where maybe it won't happen again. That's, I think that's the best we can do. Um, and we can keep eating. There's that, right? Yeah, we, we live pretty close to, we lived um, off of Pole Bridge. Yeah, right. In Misty Vale. So kind of on the, um, well, you know, where, you know where the Misty Vale Deli is? Yep. We live up the hill from there. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's been pretty awesome catching up with you, Rachel. Once again, let me give some plugs. Uh, your website, cookloveheal.com. And you can uh, also follow Rachel on Facebook and Instagram. 
if you want to see some great food and recipes. And again, if you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, the very first comment I made on this whole broadcast, and that's a link to the recipe on Rachel's website. And if you enjoy what I'm doing, please share these links. I'm going to be having guests all the time in the speakeasy. Often it's drinks. This is our very first cooking class. So thanks for being part of this, Rachel. I appreciate it. Um, thanks so much. I think what you're doing is, is really cool. Uh, Venmo tips are accepted. This is what we're doing right now for work because we're all just stuck at home and can't get out there in the wide world. So take Rachel's classes. Please keep uh, doing this. Sign up for my podcast and uh, keep communicating with each other. Connect. Connect in any way that you can. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish I could have a bowl of soup right now, but um, I know. you're going to have to have it for me. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks take so care. Much.